Today's topic about China is all about diversity. So when you say China, you think about probably like some sort of image in your head. But um, MJ wanted to cover different topics and diversity in China. Um, since this program, Geography Series, has been focusing on countries that we have like two students from, for example, Tunisia, or one student from Cambodia. So we've been focusing on little countries like we wanted to share something in Hong Kong Hall. But this time, China is obviously, it's the number one, um, how do you say, the biggest population at the U of A. And also, it's a big country. But <coughs> we wanted to have a little more like intimate program, not a huge banquet today, for you to have better understanding about the diversity in China. So she is going to cover different topics today. So if you have any questions, we'll have a question and answer time later. So MJ is an uh, um, international relations student. And she didn't live in Hong Kong, but she's been really, really active in IS's office. So I wanted to invite her to do this program with us. And we have CI. She lives in here. And we have Louis. He likes eating, obviously. So he's going <laughs> to talk about the food today. And then one more person. Oh, Duway is on the way. He's going to help us, and Duway is on the way with the food, so he's coming later. Yes. <laughs> so uh, please welcome MJ, and then she's going to take over. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. My name is Meng Zhao Liao. Could you please repeat that? Meng Zhao Liao. Perfect. But well, usually Americans call me MJ. And remember as Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, whatever, but MJ is cool. And so today I'm going to talk about, um, I will cover a variety of topics about China, because um, I'm not a big type, like a big fan of history person, so I will cover, you know, a limited amount of history, and I will be emphasized on the diverse culture in China. And obviously you can see my custom, I'm, the custom I'm wearing today is very, unique and uh, I, I don't know, have you ever guys seen stuff like this before? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's actually a uh, major minority in China, the, the group is called Hmong or Miao minority and um, the province that I'm living in is called Hunan, located in the southern part of China and we have a large minority people living there and I'm just very fortunate to have them as my, you know, homemade. <laughs> and so First of all, I would like to show you a two-minute video about our culture. So please enjoy this. The allure of China is hard to resist, from the untamed to the idyllic. China is a land of incredible diversity, picturesque rural landscapes, great cities, and unbelievable natural beauty. Civilizations. Enjoy a full Asian experience with Trafalgar. As our guest, you'll be chauffeur driven in modern motor vehicles, have all internal flights included, and stay in superb first class hotels. Through your English speaking local guide, you will discover the cultural delights of this fascinating country as you experience unforgettable sightseeing highlights. Somebody come back. 
So first of all, I'm going to talk about some general information about my country, talking about the country's size, geography. Um, then we'll have a little cultural immersion. It's called calligraphy uh, demonstration. And then we will have a C uh, from China to uh, practice calligraphy with the, one of the volunteers. And the second part will be the diverse Chinese culture. And then I will. Uh, talk about the different eth ethnic groups in China and uh, uh, the holidays that we celebrate and so on. And the third, we're, we're going to have Lu Yi from China to talk about Chinese dining with you guys. And, and he's very good about it. And the last one, we have some traditional stack sampling. And they're on the way. You know, you can't smell it yet, but we'll be safe. <laughs> All right. This is the map of my country. Uh, when I was in my elementary school, my teacher always told me the map of China looks like uh, the shape of a rooster. But then when I come here, a lot of people tell me it looks like a Mickey Mouse, the head of a Mickey Mouse. Um, and here's some basic facts about China. We're located in the east part of uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, and we have about 1.3 billion people. Uh, and then by land area, we're the fourth biggest country in the whole world. Um, I, would, I would like to quiz you guys. Do you guys know the number one, two, three countries in size? Russia. 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 Who is number one? Russia. 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 Okay. Number two? Yeah. Canada. Number, Canada. Yeah, number two is Canada. And number three? United States and China. <laughs> yes. Actually, the size of uh, United States and China are very, very similar. But I think uh, by the definition of land area, uh, U.S. is actually uh, slightly larger than China. Um, here's some, a list of major cities, and later we're going to see some pictures of it. Shanghai is the largest city in China. It has about 16 million of people. Um, the second one is uh, Beijing, which is our capital, also the political and the economic <coughs> center. And then it's Chongqing. Uh, and Shenzhen around the southern coastal area, and also Guangzhou. Um, Chinese religion is kind of like a, a mixture of the Western and the Eastern religions. We have Taoists and Buddhists, and also Christians that contains about uh, three to four percent of our religion. Um, most of us actually declare that our atheist, like we're atheists, but in fact that uh, we do believe in um, like Taoism and Buddhist philosophy. And also, um, the amount of Christian, like a member of Christian entity actually is like grow larger every day. And then we also have uh, one to two percent of Muslim that live mostly in the uh, west, north part of China. All right. Here you can get an idea where it's located. And we have some neighboring countries. <laughs> I actually, I mean, I put a good neighbors, most of them. <laughs> you can see the list of, we have Afghanistan, Bhutan, India in the south, um, actually west, and Kazakhstan. Kyrgyzstan, yeah, somebody help me. <laughs> yeah, and Laos from the south, and Mongolia uh, on the north, then Myanmar, it used to be called Burma, and then Nepal and North Korea. Pakistan, Russia, Ta Tajikistan, and Vietnam. All right. And uh, here is a brief introduction of the geography of China. We have, actually, uh, we have uh, forest status um, up in the north. Then we have Gobi uh, Desert near the Mongolia area, which is northwest. Um, then we have tropical uh, forest near Southeast Asia. And we have the, the tallest mountain in the world, which is uh, the tallest peak, Himalaya. Um, and then we also have uh, Mount Everest. Uh, it's on the uh, China and Nepal border. And also a lot of rivers down in the south. And we also have uh, 
coastline along the Pacific Ocean. I think it's one. Of, yeah, it's the 11th longest in the world. So it's pretty uh, diverse in geography. Okay. Here's some pictures of uh, just different areas in China, natural things in Ch of China. Uh, this is a picture that is taken in Sichuan, which is uh, uh, southwest of China. Uh, also, this is one, one of the most common uh, places for students in University of Arkansas going to study abroad, and how attractive it is. And also, this is the Mount Everest, located in Tibet. And this is the Gobi Desert in west north China. And this is the last one. It's an island. It's called Hainan Dao, which is in, um, a little bit away from China, but it's like a bottom south. Here's more picture. This is actually taken in my city. I mean, in my province. Um, OK? Now we're going to talk about the ethnicity of Chinese people. The largest ethnicity in China is actually Han people. Uh, which I think you see, we have about 100 or 200 students on campus. I can say 99% of them are Han. Um, it's about 1.2 billion people that are Han. Uh, and also we have a list of minority people. The number one is Zhuang, they're usually located in the southern part of China. Um, uh, and also Manchu is located in East and North Asia, I mean China. Uh, about Manchu, and they, they actually had an empire during Qing Dynasty, and they were the ones actually were in charge uh, of China for thousand years. And but um, for now, they have a lot of like a large population of Manchu actually intermarried with Han people. So now uh, they're kind of losing their culture, and you know you, you cannot really easily distinguish either they're Han or um, Manchu anymore. Now here's the other list. Here's the picture of. Um, uh, some of the minorities and the clothing they're wearing. You can see this one is actually a male minority. That's the clothing I'm wearing. They usually we will have a hat like this. And actually, I did put it on before the presentation, but then it would just keep jingling and I figured you guys wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. So if you guys want to pass around and see, it's actually made uh, with uh, silver and other metal, like a mix. <laughs> yeah, you can wear it. <laughs> All right, the languages in China. Um, how many languages do you think that we have in China? 1,000? Hmm. Other numbers? 800? Um, actually, um, yeah, I was surprised because most of people think that we speak, speak Mandarin and everybody knows how to speak Mandarin. Um, actually, um, we have about, I think it's about 13 language varieties. In China, is speaking in different parts of the area. Um, however, the standard Chinese is Mandarin. Uh, that's what we everybody has to learn from school, um, and that's how, actually how we communicate with each other. So let's say um, if um, northern part of China mainly speak Mandarin or like a kind of a language that's similar to Mandarin, so you are able to understand them well as long as you know Mandarin. But people from south, like me, if I try to communicate with the sea, she's from northeast part of China. If we try to communicate each other with our own dialects, I can understand pretty much 90% of whatever she's saying. But she probably understands, I don't know. Right? Probably 20%? Yeah, maybe 20%. And we will have uh, some practice there. So. All right, here's a little fun activity we're going to do. I'm trying to introduce you guys how to say have you eaten yet in different, in different Chinese. Um, the reason that I picked this sentence is because uh, when Chinese people greet with each other, um, we don't usually say how are you or how is your day. And I <laughs> we usually say have you eaten yet or have you eaten yet. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because food is part of our culture. <laughs> so, Beijing, in Beijing dialect, I think we have one person from Beijing. Would you like to say it in Beijing dialect? Basically, in, Be in Beijing, Beijing dialect, basically you say, Chu Lama. Chu Lama. Or Chu Lama Ning Nei. Chu Lama Ning Nei. Yeah, that's, that's how he says it. It's, it's way yeah. And then you might, do you remember? It's called Chu Lama Ning Nei. Would you guys repeat? Chu Lama Ning Nei. Yes. And in Hunan dialect, that's where I'm from. This is actually one of the Hunan dialects. 
we also have Missy. Is, is Missy. Yeah, we also have Missy. Would you stand up? This is Missy Hunan, uh, from Hunan province as well. We're from the same province, about maybe two, three hours bus drive. Yeah, three hours bus drive from each other. Yeah. And this is the way I would uh, say, have you eaten yet in Chinese? I would say, Chofan the model. Would you repeat, Chofan the model? Chofan the model. Okay. And Missy, would you say yours? Uh, which is my hometown, will say this one. I'm a <laughs> and also in Jiangsu, Jiangsu, which is, I'm sorry. Oh, I also come from Hunan. <laughs> yes. Um, would you like to say in your dialect as well? Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. And Jiangsu, which is another province, is about around this area and the uh, Louis is actually from Jiangsu. Would you say how do you how do you uh, say it? Uh, Noah Chilasa? Noah Chilasa? Noah Chilasa. And also uh, we have another guy from Iran. Is he here yet? Yeah. Yeah, what is he? Why is he? Okay, he's not here. And um, I think it's something like a uh, I'm sorry? It's from that problem. It's like Chilaiba or I really don't know. Just don't believe me. But I just try to tell you that there's a significant difference um, uh, about the language from different provinces. And so in order to communicate each other, we actually have to learn Mandarin in school. Um, and as older, from our generation, people born after 80s, 90s, we're pretty much speak like a Mandarin fluently. But for our parents and the great, like grandparents, if they try to, if they one live in the north and one live in the south, they try to communicate each other, it can cause a lot of trouble. And, you know, it's very hard to understand. All right, let's jump to economy in China. I think this part is, uh, if you get in any economics class and also like a international trade, any class that talks about economics, I think uh, China is becoming one of the heated topics. Uh, we are the fastest growing major economy since uh, 1978. And we are the largest economy after the United States. It's by both nominal GDP and PPP. The PPP stands for Purchasing Power. Parity. The last word I remember. Parity. Parity. Somebody said? Parity. Yeah, parity. And, um, uh, we are the world's largest exporter. That's why you see everything is made in China. <laughs> and then we're the second largest importer of goods. And, uh, but however, I want to point it out that on per capita terms, China is still only ranks 90 by nominal GDP. That, which means like, uh, you, you might see from the big picture, we might see them as a, like a rich culture, like a rich country. However, if you come at, you know, per person, we're still a developing country. And here's a couple pictures. This is taken in Beijing. Uh, just trying to uh, let you picture this, like, commercial area in Beijing. And this is, like, one of the factories. And she's actually making a whole bunch of Barbie dolls for the United States. <laughs> yeah. um, because our economy, like, growing just dramatically too fast, um, it actually raises a lot of problems. Uh, we have a lot of like environmental issues. A lot of beautiful places in China have actually been polluted now. Um, and the Asian population is actually uh, one of the largest, like one of the big problems as well. Um, you can see the status, how it you know increased every year, just very dramatically. So now in China, this is the status come out in 2010. So I believe now it's even more. We have 1.79 million of uh, people that are over 65 years of age. And um, as you know that uh, people born after 80s and or 90s, we're actually uh, our only child in our family. So thinking about after we graduate, actually trying to you know, take over the workplace, then how many parents will we really have to, you know, if you marry another, if you marry a husband, then, 
he would, you, would have, you guys would have to take care of uh, his parents and your parents, and only, you know, by two people. Unless, like, United States, you probably have, like, multiple siblings. And the third issue is our gender imbalance. We actually have 30 million more young men than women. And here are some pictures. Uh, I found it on the internet. This is one of the major uh, industrial centers in China. And you can see, you know, the smoke come out of it. It's just uh, being quite polluted. And also there's water in, uh, pollution. And this is a big <laughs> Yeah, because we have 30 million more young men. So. But I guess we're being like a, we're living in a globalized world. Maybe, you know, you can study abroad and fund <laughs> someone else. <laughs> okay. And here's the one child policy in China. I, t I actually titled this picture, I call it One and, Lo one and Lonely. Actually, it's One and Lonely. Um, you can see most of the Chinese parents uh, actually have one child. And so they actually, um, I cannot say it's like a problem because everything has a good side and a bad side. <coughs> Just talking about my personal experience, um, I really, you know, um, as I grew up, I really wanted a sibling. Just kind of like uh, to play with me or to you know share stuff with me, um, but unfortunately most of us don't even, don't really get a chance to have a sibling unless you're living in some like uh, really uh, rural area where you just kind of uh, require some you know laborers to work on the field and the government will give you some you know special laws and to protect you from having you know maybe a couple more children. But the majority of Chinese only have one child. Okay, and here's uh, some traditional holidays in China. Uh, the main one we just had, which is, uh, it, took, uh, it took place last weekend. The last weekend. No, the week, the week before last weekend was January 28th. We had this large uh, Chinese festival celebration. How many guys were you there? Like, were there? Good. <laughs> yes, um, so Chinese New Year is actually the largest holiday in China. Uh, we celebrate actually for the whole 15 days. Usually the business uh, will start uh, closing from the 30th of New Year all the way till the 8th of January. So there's eight days in a row that it's really hard for you to go out and just try to uh, go shopping and stuff because everybody usually is staying home and resting. Um, there are a lot of traditions in Mo. Um, we usually have a large meal on the 30th uh, of uh, December where get families are all gathered and we will uh, play a lot of the games, like uh, the older people, they like to do this little gambling game called Mahjong. It requires four people to play. And now, usually kids, we like to go out and to, uh, to do some fireworks. Usually we call it firecrackers. It's, it's usually not like a fancy uh, like a fires that you see usually in the United States. It usually just makes this loud sound. And um, there's a legend behind it. Uh, we think... Uh, Long time, thousands of years ago, there was a monster called the Nian. Uh, we're actually attacking. Sometimes come to the earth, they're attacking like some villages. And in order to scare these people away, and uh, we usually put the firecrackers and just trying to scare them away. And here, now we're going to do an activity. It's called culture immersion, uh, Chinese calligraphy. Now, please welcome Masi. She's going to do the demonstration with you guys. My name is Si. I'm from China. And in Chinese, Si means cherish. Because the one child policy, when my parents were giving birth to me, they were like, oh, she's going to be the only child. So why don't we just name her Cherish? So that's my name, Si. And I'm going to talk about Chinese calligraphy. Chinese calligraphy, according to the definition, it is an art of turning the square Chinese characters into an expressive images by the responsiveness of paper and also the speed and pressure of a writing brush. So you can see here, the first important point is the Chinese characters which are square. And then they have a special paper and special writing brush, which is not the pencil or the pen that you use every day. And then, in China, they are doing the calligraphy. There are four treasures, four treasures as we call. First one is the traditional writing brush. These are just the different type of types of writing brush. And here is a little introduction of the writing brush. 
It can be traced back to the Neolithic age, which is a super long time ago, and it is made of animal hair, usually a wolf or goat, and a bamboo stick. The bamboo part is this one, and these part are made of just animal hair, whichever type you prefer. And the second one is a ink. So the ink is commonly made by burning pine or another wood in an earthenware container mixing dense ash with glue and um, pressing it into a solid ink stick or another form. So back when many years ago, the ink usually comes in the form of an ink stick, like solid. But now since it is kind of hard to carry and it's usually just compressed into liquid. And the third of the four treasures is a rice paper. So rice paper is usually made from parts of the rice plant, like rice straw or rice flour. The paper is very, very thin and light, so it can absorb ink easily. There was one time when I was giving this presentation to some elementary school kids. One of them raised their hand and asked me, me see, if it's really made from rice, can we eat it? <laughs> it's such a cute question. I, I have to say that I have been doing calligraphy for 10 years. Even when I was a child, I didn't try. So, I don't know. But I can promise you you're not gonna go die, but I have no idea if it tastes good or just like paper. So, yep, that's red paper. And the last one is an ink stone. An ink stone is literally a stone mortar for the container of ink. Calligrapher can mix ink with different amount of water in the ink stone to create different densities and shades. And as you can see, the ink stone is not just a stone. It usually has decorations. For example, this one, it has a dragon, a face of an angry dragon. And usually it comes with different decorations. And today I'm just gonna introduce the three different types of Chinese calligraphy. Like, there are many different dialects in China. When you are doing calligraphy, there are also <coughs> many different types. For example, this one, there are the three different styles. First one is the Li Shu style, which you can also call it as clerical script. As the name you can tell, it was invented many years ago by the clergy at, at the, working for the kings during these uh, empires. And these are the ones that you take the longest of time to write it, but looks, I think it's really pretty. The second one is what we use on a daily base. It is called Kai Shu style, also the regular script. <coughs> when we were in elementary school, the first style we learned is the Kai Shu style. And the last one is Xing Shu style. You can see all the lines, the strokes are kind of connected together. It's like running. You don't really have to like walk at a slow pace. So this is called the Xing Shu style. And today I'm gonna teach you how to write Fu, which means happiness or good luck. Mm. Now I need two volunteers. I will provide rice paper and writing brush and ink. Who wanna try? I need two volunteers. Okay, you do. <coughs> So first of all, I have the rice paper. Here, where's yours? Did you guys just want to see the texture of it? You can just pass it on. I don't have none of it. Since the ink stone is so heavy to carry, so I didn't bring it from China to here. So we just we're gonna use this one instead. <laughs> And then they have ink. <laughs> and it smells really good. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Oh, why not? It's not bad. And then they have rain brush. So I'm gonna take this one. Uh, you can pass it on the snow. <laughs> 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 I need to bring this one. 
So we're going to start writing calligraphy. And when you're learning Chinese, especially learning how to write Chinese, there is a certain way, like a certain order, you put different lines and strokes. So I'm just going to write, and you guys can follow me. Okay. Okay. So first, get some ink. Oh, and there's one thing I forgot to mention. When you're holding the writing brush, you don't hold it as you are normally write your homework or something. You will put your two fingers. I'm, I'm right-handed, so you will put your finger here and your thumb the other way, holding the, holding the bamboo part. And these two fingers, just the other way, try to like push and make it, make it stay. Mm -hmm. And since we are writing this character, whoop, we are going to start. It looks complicated, but I promise you it's not that hard to write. So first of all, we are going to start from the right hand side corner with a point. Second, we are going to do a line and turn down side. And then we are going to do a line like this. We are going to follow it with another point. And then we're moving to the right hand side. Another line. And a small line. And then follow it with another squire. <laughs> and then do the same thing, but for the bottom part. And then put like a little cross there. And then the last line. <laughs> and then we're done. <coughs> Give them the first. So as you can see, this is a calligraphy we did. And even mine is different from the one you can see on the board. It's just because different calligraphers do different styles. Even though it's the same in the running script, it's still different, like minor details. And also, I have a stamp. I have a stamp, and it has a really nice case. It's like the ink stone, but also has some decorations over there. And when you are when you are finishing your uh, your work, you usually would put a stamp on the work you did. This one is the one with my name, so it means I wrote it. <laughs> when you are putting the uh, the uh, the stamp of your name, you would usually put it on the bottom left corner of the work you did. So it will be something like this. And then I can say, it is a finished work of mine, what I just did. Yep. And that's it. I'm going to give it back to MJ and she's going to cover more materials. Um, no. All right. Um,
to our second part. The name of it is Diverse Chinese Culture. Uh, just a reminder, um, we're kind of running a little late, so I might have to extend the program for you know a little period of time. But you guys, if you really have something to do, you guys can. <laughs> okay. The first one I'm going to introduce is the North China, which includes Beijing, Tianjin, and the provinces of Hebei and Shanxi, and also the Inner Mongolia. Um, here's some <coughs> pictures of Inner Mongolia. Um, the uh, geography, the geography of the main area of Mongolia is grassland. It's like massive um, amount of grasslands with uh, very low mountains. Uh, uh, Man Mongolia is, is one of the largest minority in China as well. Um, they, they live in places, it's called the yurts, it looks like this. Um, and the, most of them are, uh, most of them are like uh, uh, having their own like living stocks and also like it just plant, uh, not usually plant, but usually they, uh, they drink a lot of horse milk and then uh, they eat a lot of meat, so like uh, there's not a very much of vegetation in that area because, because of the uh, geography. And also, in the Mongolia has a festival called the Nadan Festival. It's basically an event of a horse horsemanship and a wrestling and shooting. Here are some of the pictures of the festivals. Um, here's another picture. It is a city located in North China. It's our capital, Beijing. Uh, this is just like a line view of the streets in Beijing. Here is the building of our national channel, CCTV. It, it was just built um, about three, four years ago. And then here is the Asian view of Beijing. We have the Great Wall, uh, which started building in Qing Dynasty. Um, also, we have Forbidden City. This is where uh, the empires and his family used to live at. And also, this is within the Forbidden City area. And this is the Tiananmen Square. Uh, you can see the pictures of Tiananmen Mao. Uh, and here, this is the Beijing uh, 2008 Olympic Games Stadium. Uh, it's very huge, and the style of it, I think uh, the idea comes from a, a nest, like a bird nest. Uh, it's really pretty, and this is this the swimming stadium, or like the aquarium stadium, for the 2008 Olympics. And this is another city, it's called Qingdao. It's located in North China as well. Um, have it, has anybody tasted Qingdao beer? Yes, it's actually um, originated from Qingdao. And there, I have a little facts to tell. The reason that a Qingdao beer is very good, you guys know that Chinese people, like, beer is not originated from China. And so basically, uh, during the war time, <coughs> Germany actually colonized the China for a short period of time, and they left the recipe in Qingdao. And that's actually why they get a recipe from the Germans. That's why the beer is very good. You can easily get it at local Chinese restaurants around northwest Arkansas. Um, this is just a form of art. It is fa very famous. It's counted as our national treasure for <coughs> Beijing Opera. Um, it's just... Um, a combines of music and vocal performances and dance and acrobatics. Here are some pictures. And you see usually people put a very heavy makeup on. Uh, usually girls will put like a, all the white pants on the face and also draw the like a edges eyes like a Chinese. And next part is Northeast Asia, uh, China. That's actually where C is coming from. Uh, it's also called a Manchu area. So. You guys might heard that term from history before. And here are some uh, just views of uh, uh, northeast of China. Uh, it's a very cold place. It's very close to Russia. So, um, and Russians did like colonize the full part of the uh, Harbin city for a while, and that's why we actually have buildings like this. It's actually with a strong like a Russian influences. And here's the, you see we call it Harbin. Uh, Harbin is uh, like a, one of the largest cities in northeast China. Uh, we call the city actually Ice City because it's very cold, and then they usually have festivals where they just build a whole bunch of like a ice ice castle. This is just a view of this like a, um, buildings with ice. And here's another minority in China. You can see the dresses they wear. 
um, it's called a Manchu, and they were actually, uh, they founded the Qing Dynasty, which is uh, from 1616 to 1912. Um, like, I, like I mentioned, because nowadays, a lot of Manchu people actually intermarried with Chinese, uh, with Chinese Han, so you cannot, you get really hard to distinguish from us anymore. And I do have uh, this little fan, it's kind of part of their culture. And this is uh, also another art that is usually performed by uh, Northeast China, Chinese people. Okay, let's go over to Northwest China. Uh, we have Shanxi, Gansu, and the Qinghai provinces. Uh, in this area of China, we have a large minority called the Uyghur. I will, I'm going to show you in just in a minute. And also, I want to mention that uh, this part of the, like in China is mainly covered with desert, so it's a part of like a dry, dry part of our country. You can see the pictures, and you know if uh, if we usually when you think about China, you think about all these temples and you know water, river, but this is actually a large part of China, Chinese country as well. We have a lot of deserts, and uh, in a lot of dry area, people usually live in a house like a, a cave like this. And they usually keep them warm in the winter and you know get pretty cool in the summer. And this is the Uyghur minority in China. We call it Weibo or Zhu. Uh, they're actually um, uh, uh, how do you say a branch of like a Turkic people. Um, um, their religion is actually Sunni Muslim, and that's like different from uh, majority of Chinese people. Um, and uh, also, you can see the appearance. That they don't really look like a full East Asian. They're kind of like a mixture of Turkish and Kazakh, just around the area. area. And the language they speak uh, is very, very different from our language as well. Uh, and they're fam famous for their instrument, and the ladies are very good at dancing. And here's another part of a uh, Northwest China culture. It's called the shadow play. I actually have an example of it. We call it a shadow play or like a shadow pup, pup tree. So usually you will have a lot of people staying in the background and just kind of move the sticks as the, uh, the figure moving at the front. And also it's uh, accompanied with the music, and the languages. And then we have South Central China, which is my favorite uh, because I'm from right here. <laughs> uh, it's including the Guangdong, Henan, <coughs> Hubei, and the Hunan province, which is right here. And here's some pictures. I call it MJ's Dreamland because <laughs> this is where I'm from. Uh, this is from uh, South, little southwest area of China. They have a lot of like temples like this and bridges. This is the you know the construction of things. This mountain is actually uh, located in my province. We call it Zhang Jiajie. Um, now they actually named after the after the movie Avatar because it looks kind of like the mountains from Avatar, it, especially when it's cloudy. You can only see the upper part, so it's like a, it's like a, a stone like it, out of nowhere and hanging in the sky. So we call it actually Avatar Mountain now. <laughs> Here's the waterfall. Um, yes, and this is a small city located in my uh, province. It's called Fenghuang, which means Phoenix. Um, it, this city is uh, mainly like there's a lot of like uh, it's kind of like v Venus in Italy. So usually people build a house among the water, and the main transportations are actually like boats. And here's some other pictures. Uh, this is the. Uh, just some natural things like Chinese. And around this part, we also have a male minority in China. Uh, this is the costume that I'm wearing today. Uh, male women are really uh, famous at singing, and this is actually one of the most famous singers in China. Uh, and they, they have a lot of uh, just like special costumes that they're colored in, you know, blue. Usually it's blue and uh, red, and, and they just carry this like a col like a colorful culture. And also, uh, they're actually known as mom. Known as mom. We actually have uh, mom students from 
Laos or like a Vietnam, which is like a neighboring country to China. And just let you guys know that we have kind of one of the largest Hmong population in my country. And this is the festival they have, they celebrate. This is the largest festival they celebrate every year. You can see it's actually a pretty modernized place. It's like a, 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 a street in a city, but they usually just come out and do a lot of, you know, parades and dancing. And also guys will blue is called uh, instruments and kind of having a context. And this is the south uh, west part of China, which includes <coughs> Tibet, Yunnan, and Guizhou, and also Sichuan. I want to emphasize on this province just because we have a lot of students from University of Arkansas actually go study abroad here. It's a beautiful place. I'll show you guys some pictures. Um, I want to emphasize that Panda is the original from Sichuan province. So if you want to see Panda in your lifetime, please go. And uh, this is like uh, one of the largest national park in China. It's very beautiful. Um, now we also have some pictures of Tibet, which is the, the snow mountain. And also um, they have a, like a massive grassland <coughs> as well. And this is the picture taken in Yunnan. Uh, which is most of the minority people leave. They have about maybe over 30 kinds of uh, like ethnicities they're located in the Iran province. Uh, a little introduction of Tibetan minority. Uh, Tibetan is actually is an old nationality in China. Uh, according to the histor historical records, early before Qing and Han Dynasty, the ancestors of Tibetan <coughs> actually gathered along the banks of the middle and reached this place in Tibet. <laughs> Um, they are, um, they eat a lot of uh, rice and noodles, and, but mainly their dish is also like beef, uh, beef meat and like other, uh, maybe poultry meat. And also they drink a lot of like milk and sour milk. And uh, this is a kind of like only part of Chinese culture that people eat cheese on a regular basis. Okay, now I'm going to teach you guys how to do a a pressure relief like eye exercise. This is what we do every day in all the way through elementary school to high school. So if you get your hands ready, yes. Okay, the first part of the exercise is you're using these two thumbs and you press it on your nose, like the upper part of your nose, like around this bone. And you you will do like a you roll it like upwards and inwards. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you repeat about four, uh, like eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the, sec the second one is you use uh, your thumb and this finger. And you put it on the, around the same area, but you do it upwards, like up and down, up and down. So it's one, two, three, four. And you repeat for about a minute or two. And the, the third part is put your like two fingers on each hand. And then you press it off, like beside your nails, right beside the nostrils. And then you uh, pull back two hands. The two hands that are, the, the two fingers that are like you more close. And then you roll it outwards. One, two, three, four. You work. One, two, three, four. Yes. And the last part will be press your thumb um, on the top of your ear. It's very hard, and the pressure point is how do you describe it? Here? Yeah, like, like right here. Your yeah, temple? Everybody can see it. Your, tem so, your temple. <laughs> yeah. And then. You use your this finger, and you kind of uh, touches your eyebrow with this part of your finger. And so you do one, two, three. You have you have to feel the pressure. Three, four, and you just keep repeating it. And that's way that's the way we do it. If you take a you know five minutes every day, keep your eyes healthy. <laughs> All right, and now I'm going to give the presentation time to Mr. Louis from China. He's going to talk about Chinese cuisine with you guys. Oh, I have a microphone here. But um, you guys eating yet? 
No. Mm -hmm. Shalom. Have you guys eaten yet? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> all right. How do you say yes? No. Yes. Yes will be sh. Uh, sh. No will be bu. <laughs> okay. Well. Um. Well, my name is Louis, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about Chinese food with you guys today. Um, <coughs> you guys have been wondering what these two Chinese characters mean. Let me tell you what. These two means the people who love to eat. It means the people who think eating is such a joyful and wonderful thing to do in their lives. I'm one of those people, okay? Sure, well, I'm one of those true ones. And um, I love eating so much, and food has been one of the reasons that I, I decided to come to the United States. You know, because um, cheeseburger from McDonald's cause, uh, was all I could get when I was a kid in China. So, you know, let's. How do you? Oh, okay. There you go. Sure was. You got sure by the way? Who loves to eat? Okay. Some in the back. Okay, okay. That's cool. um, okay. The Chinese food are basically divided into four main categories. It's. um. Lu cuisine, Su cuisine, Yue cuisine, and Chuan cuisine. Okay, Lu is pretty much the north part of China. Su is the southeast part. Yue is, is about the south part, and Chuan is the southwest part. Okay, I'm gonna. I thought I have like 20 minutes or something, but they tell me I have like five minutes, so I just go over it. Okay, um, Lu cuisine. Um, the emphasis of Lu cuisine is about the tenderness, and the freshness, and the crispiness of the food. The, of the meat and vegetables. So, here's a great example of blue cuisine. It's kung pao chicken. Who's who's had it before? Mm. Kung pao chicken. It's um, it's very famous. It's one of the most famous in the United States. Uh, you can have those in JD China, even though it's not very good. <laughs> um, uh, here's a, here's a picture of the sweet and sour fish. In order to make it crispy, the chefs always deep fry the fish before everything. Then they top the sweet and sour sauce, the homemade sweet and sour sauce on top. Here's another picture of the sweet and sour fish. It's, um, never had those before, but it looks pretty good to me. Oh, wait. Okay. See, I, I did a preparation for my friends. I changed the thing. I got a different dish for, for you guys. Uh, I have no idea how to talk about this. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's, it's just some kind of dumb place. Forget about it. Forget about it. Sukuzin. <laughs> okay, Sukuzin. Um, Sukuzin developed uh, around the area of Jiangsu province and Zhejiang province. Jiangsu is where I'm from. I'm from Wuxi. And uh, the emphasis of Sukuzin is the sweetness. Okay, Sukuzin makes the sweet, sweetest the food in China, the Chinese food. And as a matter of fact, the city I'm from, Wuxi, is the sweetest, sweetest of the sweetest. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, here's a, here's a, here's a, we call it lion head, the head of the lion. I have no idea what they call it, but it's it's just pretty much kind of like meatballs um, with rice in it. They make the ball, make the meatballs with pork and uh, vegetables and, and lots of rice. And the, the orange thing on top is the crab cream. So it's it, it's got a different it's got a um, kind of different taste of it, you know. Um, the chef always um, apparently make the meatballs and put it in the steam basket and they steam it. It's um, it's it's really good. It's really good. Uh, here's a um, here's a picture of the the tofu soup. Um, you guys may think tofu is a square thing, but this is actually tofu. The chef cut it, th cut the tofu into pieces. So the difficulty of this is that tofu is so soft and it's so hard, to so, so hard to cut. You know, it's um, it's very hard to make, and um, it's very, it's creamy. It's it's definitely sweet. It's sweet, and uh, you can only get those in a, in a fancy restaurant, I guess. Not many, not many people can make this thing. Um, yep. Okay. Um, here's a picture of. Uh, Stinky tofu, stinky tofu. Okay. Um, there are things that you need to do if you go to, if you ever go to China. You know, you go see the Great Walls and everything. You go see the Tiananmen Square. This is the third thing you need to do, man. I'm telling you what. Um, you can't get this anywhere on the street side of China. It's cheap. Two yen for each order. You know, it's like a quarter. It's cheap. 
It's, it smells so bad, it's stinky. You can smell this thing like miles away, okay? But it's so delicious. Every single one in China loves this thing. It's just delicious thing to eat. Okay, I have no idea how to describe this thing, but if you ever go to China, just try this. Try this stinky tofu. Okay, let's move on to New York cuisine. Do they actually call it stinky tofu? Yes, we do. Yes, sir. It's pretty stinky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, real cuisine. The emphasis of real cuisine is, this, is soup. Let's see here, the soup. Um, real cuisine tend to make uh, creamy and thick soup, um, different from the soup in other cuisines. Okay, um, they use this kind of bowl. Um, they cook the soup for over five hours, and um, to make it as thick and creamy. Uh, here's a picture of the eggplant. Uh, you might think it's easy to make, but eggplant is actually one of the hardest uh, vegetables to make in Chinese cuisine. Because um, eggplant actually sucks oil, so before you ever cook the eggplant, you have to deep fry the eggplant, then you cook it with sauce and uh, green peppers and everything. Um, it's delicious. Um, every time I go to Dallas, I go to some restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, I have to order this. And uh, here's a picture of a uh, seasoned garlic oyster. So if you guys like seafood, Real Cuisine is the way to go. It's the way to go. And uh, here's a picture of uh, different kinds of dim sums of, from the Real Cuisine. And, uh, my roommate, is, my roommate is actually from Guangdong province, where real cuisine developed. Um, so he, he, he told me that every single, every single week, he has to go to a restaurant where they serve dim sum with their family, sit around the table, drink some tea, and pass the dim sum. That's the culture, uh, right there. And, um, the last one, last one, tran cuisine, tran cuisine. Trang cuisine, emphasis on trang cuisine is about the spiciness. Um, you can see hmm. every single, pretty much every single dish, there's red pepper, all kinds of pepper right there, the green, green, green onion in the dish. I think this is, um, this is, um, this is, uh, this is a pork blood cake. Okay, this is pork blood cake. A little little chunk of blood in the soup. Uh, it's not actually soup. It's actually um, pepper oil. So it's really really spicy. Okay. And uh, it's this is um pretty much the same thing with the sliced fish. So it's pretty much the same thing as the pork blood. Okay. Okay. Um, Dwight Howard from a lot of magic, the NBA player, actually went to China a couple years ago, had one of these, and he was like, man, the Trump cuisine is so hot, Buffalo Wild Wings like nothing, <laughs> I mean, yeah, Buffalo Wild Wings like nothing, so you guys stay, you can't eat hot food, let's go to China and see what we can do, <laughs> we'll get you some hot food, we'll get you some hot food. Um, here's a picture of the Mapo Tofu, it's a, it's a very usual dish in China, it's not hard made. Um, Do Waker makes this, you know, it, uh, it's, it's really, it's a little spicy, it's not that spicy though, it's, it's pretty spicy, but it's good. And uh, finally, let's go to my all-time favorite food of Chinese cuisine. Um, it's the pecking duck. Pecking duck is my all-time favorite food. Uh, every time I go back, I have to have these. Um, the chef? Uh, put the duck into the oven for like 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Fully cooked it, and they'll they'll put the duck on a on a cart and take it out in front of you, and they'll start the chef will start car cutting the um, duck meat into pieces. If you go to like a if you go to like a fancy restaurant, they'll cut the meat into exactly 108 pieces, and every single piece has the meat. It has the crispy skin, okay? So it's, it's awesome, this is awesome. And the skin doesn't have any flavors, 
but it melts in the mouth. And uh, it's definitely crispy. And the meat is so juicy. Um, they have um, they have um, many different kinds of sauces that you can you can dip it in. Um, and you have the the flat bread, flat bread. You can you know wrap the meat with onions and everything. You can eat like that. It's delicious and then it's my all time favorite. I think that's all I got. Yeah. Um, this is actually our whole presentation. Thank you so much. I know we're going to have you next time to cover every bit of Chinese culture. But if you guys are interested, uh, we actually have an organization on campus. It's Chinese Students and Scholars Association. We host um, several events throughout the year, uh, like the one, the one we just did for the Chinese New Year. And we will always keep you guys updated. Um, just beware of the, you know, Hocom. Facebook page and everything. We'll, we'll keep you guys updated. Thank you so much for coming. And um, we, I think the food already, right? Um, okay, I have a question. How many of you guys are taking Chinese classes right now? Wave your hand. And how many of you are thinking of going to China for study abroad? Okay, okay. And then, who's taking human geography class? Okay, great. Thank you, thank you. Um, again, like I think uh, MJ mentioned that China is becoming more and more popular as a, a study abroad destination, and it is true. I think it's just nationwide, and then because you know China is growing really quickly, and for the UVA students, it's becoming more popular destination. And also, again, we have the you know the biggest number of students. The group is Chinese students, and we have so many cultural exchange opportunities, and it's so hard to crush everything into one hour and then she was having a hard time to pick up like you know what kind of topics she wants to cover and then everything so it feels like it was probably quick but um, there's so many opportunities on campus for you guys to get to know more about Chinese culture so please keep in touch with them and also as she said um, get you know get, get involved with the CSSA Chinese Students and the Scholars Association and everything else so I really would like to say thank you to MJ and her friends thank you Dumpling and is it pork yeah. dumpling? And also, is that something sweet? Yeah. Okay, it's so it's, dessert. Okay, it's like a dessert, like a tortilla looking, and I think the way it's going to help you to get some food. So there's some food over there, so enjoy. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to bed on it.